G'day folks, I'm Bill Gray and welcome to South Australia. Now right at this moment in time I'm sitting about 10 to 15 kilometres east of a small town on the South Australian coast called Goolawa. And this stretch of water that I'm standing in is right at the very end of one of Australia's most famous rivers, the Great Murray River. And over the next four weeks or so, I'll be travelling over 2,500 kilometres in the trail craft here, right up into the far reaches of the Murray River. And then from there, I'll be taking you by four-wheel drive up into Australia's beautiful Kosciuszko National Parks, and then deep into the Snow Mountains. We will be driving up rock ledges and through the rivers if the need be, all in the search of where this great river first begins as just a small trickle that flows from the side of a mountain. We'll be covering the history of this great river, and in its past, its hidden stories and untold secrets, along with its future and the very importance of its water. And all of this on one of the driest continents on Earth, our beautiful land of Australia. Well, we have over 2,500 kilometres to travel. A new trial craft to take us there, a brand new Mercury outboard to power us a distance, and a whole mountain of stories to tell you all at home. So let's get a move on, hey? To my left here, we have the small town of Goolawa, which was once one of the busiest river boat ports in the Murray. In fact, it was the first ever inland port in Australia. Now, Goolawa is a place where many famous Murray River paddle boaters were originally built. And at its busiest time, there were four boat companies here and as many as 27 paddle steamers and two barges. And they were built here when the town was at its busiest in around 1880. And if you're wondering where the name Goolawa came from, it's Aboriginal for elbow. In the 1840s, when the small town was first surveyed, it was known as Town on the Goolawa, or Town on the Elbow, as it's situated on a large bend in the river. Its name was then changed to Port Pullen, but then later changed back to just plain old Goolawa. Now all around me now is Lake Alexandrina, which is a huge lake that is quite incredible. You see all the water from the Murray runs in and fills this whole area. And the whole water surface area that you see behind me is about 380 square kilometres in size. And the whole lot of it is only between 2 and 5 metres in depth. Which means when the wind picks right up, it can be a very, very dangerous place to cross. And because of the huge amount of water that the area covers, and a distance from one safe spot to the other of only 25 kilometres, you can see why and how many small boats and paddle steamers have come to grief and sunk on this very lake behind me here and the one that we're about to cross. Now just before we cross Lake Alexandrina, the area of land behind me there and then just in a few kilometres is known as the Kurong National Park. Now one side of her backs under the water's edge here and the other side goes right up to the Southern Ocean. Now right at the Murray River mouth there's a small place called Baker's Knoll. And it was there in 1857 that a huge mast was erected. And on that mast was only the second flag in Australia to ever show the Southern Cross. Well, we've just crossed Lake Alexandrina with no travels, and we're now about 76 kilometres from the river mouth. Um, now we're just going past the small town of Wellington now, and it was here that a man by the name of Frank Potts was known to have built the very first ferry uh, over the river here in the mid 1840s. Uh, before that, the drivers would bring their cattle from various parts of Victoria and South Australia, and they were said to have lost countless numbers of stock as they tried to swim across the river here with their herds. Uh, from one side to another, which is about probably 150, 200 metres wide. Uh, so you can just imagine how tired the cattle and the horses and the men would have been after they tried to swim across such a large stretch of water. Um, plus, sometimes it would be a fast flowing current. So it was no wonder that a lot of the livestock was lost and drowned, and it was no wonder that the very first ferry on the river here was very warmly welcomed.
Now, just before it gets too dark, I'll show you this place behind me here. Now, this is the first pumping station on the Maya River, and we're about 10 kilometres up from Wellington. Now, the pumps here, they take water inland through South Australia for about 130 kilometres, and they irrigate about 1,750,000 uh, acres worth of pastoral land. So it really is quite, quite incredible, but you'll find over the next few weeks that the amount of water that this place takes out of the river is absolutely nothing compared to what we're going to see later on. Well, we're at one of the largest towns at the Murray River at the moment, which is called Murray Bridge. And um, it was back here before any of the bridges were originally built. It was just named after the first white settler to ever take his cattle across the river here, named Mr. Edwards. And uh, because of that, the, the place we're at now, Murray Bridge, used to be just called um, Edwards Crossing. And it was a lot more favourable crossing here compared to um, the one back down at Wellington the rat yesterday, about 20 or 30 kilometres back. Now the cattlemen, were just like down at Wellington, they would swim their cattle across from one side to the other here, um, along with supplies and so forth from either side of the river. It was even said that once the men from the South Australian side were so desperate for their beer, they tied all their kegs down onto a big wooden, uh, wooden horse cart and pushed it into the river. And then when it floated, they hooked on a large piece of rope and dragged the whole lot across the other side just so they could have their beer. Um, so you know, the guys around here, they did some pretty crazy things for their alcohol. Now the Port of Murray Bridge here, she was first born in about 1864. But before that, this whole area was known as the Turnoff, as many of the overlanders bring their cattle and sheep from various parts of Victoria and South Australia would get to the river here and either cross or turn off. But before that, the Aboriginals, they had a name for this place all for their own. And when that's translated into English, it means heaven for birds. Now, nine years after the town was first settled here, it got the first bridge over the Murray. However, some people think that 20 years earlier, further up at Echuca, a man by the name of Henry Hopwood, he had himself a pontoon bridge. So they're not really sure who, who or where the first bridge came from. But by all accounts, it was here on the Murray Bridge. Then nine years after that, they got their first railway bridge, which meant all of, this, all of the river traffic that used to go down to Goolaway, 113 kilometres down the river, instantly stopped and this place here, these wharfs, became a thriving inland port and a very popular town and it grew very quickly. Now as history goes, when the first bridge was built here across the Murray, a man threw himself into one of these huge, huge pylons here behind me because he wanted to get entombed in concrete. Now, um, as you can imagine, back when they first built these bridges, this railway bridge, there would have been no way of getting him out. So once he jumped in, all his crewmen did was kind of shake their head and then keep on building. Now it's the first thing in the morning on our second day now and this mud is very soft and very stinky and very disgusting but I have something oh, man, just over here that when I get out of this I'm going to show you. Now these banks that I'm walking up they're called levee banks and they start way down the stream at Wellington about 20 kilometres and they go a kilometre after kilometre up river. And what they're designed to do is keep the water out of the valuable pasture land to my right here. And that's very important because all the dairy farmers in this area, 
they help supply over 44 million litres of milk all throughout Adelaide all year round. Now back in 1929, all these levee banks were finished and they were built by hundreds and hundreds of men of all different nationalities and they got a nickname of the Mud Packers. An incredible thing about all these levee banks is that all of them were built by hand. This little town I have to my left here is called Manham, and it's 150 kilometres from the river mouth. And it was known to be the birthplace of the paddle steamer. And it was once called by the river travellers uh, Pondy, which is Aboriginal for place of the Great Murray Cod. Now these are huge freshwater fish, and the largest one that was ever caught was in 1960, and that weighed 113 kilograms. Now, the very first paddle steamer to Ever Lake a Kill in the Murray was built here in Manham in 1852 by William R. Randall. And he was one of the great pioneers of the Murray River in the early paddle steamer days and the river trading days. The first ever paddle steamer to be in the water here was called the Mary Ann. And that was done just up river from this spot here. But Mr. Randall, he also built himself a huge shipping yard here at uh, Manham as well as some dry docks, but later on he sold that. Uh, to a guy who eventually owned seven paddle steamers and the largest one he had was named uh, the Manham and she was 135 feet long. Now the town of Manham here first started to take off because of the river trade but it also started to grow when wheat was first planted in this area. The first man to do that was a butcher whose name was Benjamin Baysby and he did so right here in this very oval which is now the Manham Showgrounds. And then a man by the name of Mr. Walker, he built the very first flour mill here. And he did that in 1876. And from there, he supplied damper and bread all throughout Queensland, using the river boats, using camel trains, and using bullock teams. Well, as you can see, it's too dark in now for me to show you any more of this town, but in the morning, I'm going to come back and show you something which changed the way farmers all over this district did their work. Okay, now let's see if we can go and find that contraption that I was talking about last night. Now what I was looking for is a thing called a stump jump plough. And that was designed back in 1877 by two brothers, a John and a David Shearer. And it was here in Manham that they first patented the idea of this particular plough. Now the stump jump plough, like the rest of them back in their days, were towed by bullocks. But the difference between the stump jump plough and the rest of them was that with the stump jump, when it hit a log or a stone, the actual plough would jump up over the, over the obstacle and then keep on going instead of the old versions which would, would hit the obstacle and then bend and wreck the machine or wreck the apparatus. So the stump jump was a uh, plough on the ground, it had hit a hard rock, a big spring would spring it up, it would come back in and keep on going without any damage to the equipment. So it was 130 years ago in this very spot that the Shearer brothers designed and built the very first stump jump plough. But now, Hallward Bagshire Industries has carried on the great tradition of making some of the world's best and leading farm machinery. And some of their machinery is just in here in this shed.
And up here we have a thing called the scary bar. And I'll show you that because I think you'll find it's quite interesting. So on this machine here, what happens? Is at the front goes a cutting blade, which gets lowered then into the dirt and digs the hole. We move to the back. And we have another cutting blade, and they're shaped like this. And you get different sorts and different shapes. Then we have two tubes. In the first tube goes down fertilizer. In the second tube drops down a seed and then some more fertilizer. Then at the back here we have this wheel and that compresses the whole lot into the dirt. And it's shaped like it is, so when it crushes the, she the seed in, it's then left a bit of a channel. So when it rains, the water rushes in and, and uh, waters the seed. Now if you plant wheat with this machine here, within four days, if you get some rain, you can have a, have a shoot coming into the ground about this big. Now the old stump jump plough that we're talking about, when they were brand new, they were about 200 pounds. But you can pick up one of these bad boys for about $146,000. Well, we're finished here at Manham, so let's get back in the boat and head further on up the river. You remember just a few minutes ago we were talking about uh, David and John Shearer, the two guys that invented the stump jump plough. Well, just as we leave Manham here, it's worth remembering that David, one of the brothers, he also invented the first steam-powered automobile in Australia, the working differential. And apparently, so the story goes, he did that ten years before Henry Ford invented his. They were just a few kilometres upstream from Manham, and those cliffs you can see behind me there are called the rocks. And it was this quarry that half a million tonnes of granite was taken out of to be used on the, the locks and the weirs along the Murray here. And when we find some of these rocks a little later on, if we can see them a little better, we'll stop and, and give you all a look. You see that tree behind me there, up on the bank with the bark missing, that's called a canoe tree, and that was used for the Aboriginals to um, make canoes out of it. They used to cut the, cut the big bark off it, and then lower it in the water, and then use it like that. They'd use other branches to keep it pried open, and then reach to keep it all together. They'd also use the, the sap from the tree to plug up leaks. They also used the, the bark for shields for fighting, and for containers for carrying things. And they also, they also use it as a shelter. In a big storm, they'd cut a bit off and then put it over the top of them. But we'll, we'll carry on a bit because it's very tricky and um, we'll move further up the river. Now I'm here at Chucka Bend at the moment and this place was named after a man named Charlie Cavan. And out of all of the clear water along here that you can see, one day his horse threw him into the only stinky mud pit that it could find. And then for months and months after that, they couldn't get the stink out of Charlie. Now one day, Charlie was back down the river at Manham there in a hotel called the Bogan Hotel. And apparently he was in a bad mood and shooting shot glasses off the counter with his pistol. So he was chased from there by the sheriff to this very corner, where then he jumped himself, his horse, and his cart straight into the river. So Charlie threw himself into the river here somewhere, himself and his horse and cart, and swam to the other side. Now they say that after that day, he never stunk of the river mud again. And as legend goes, when Charlie threw himself his horse and cart in the river here, in the pitch dark in the middle of the night, at full steam, the stink jumped off him, and it was too frightened to ever return again.
So we're just a few kilometres upstream from Walker Flat at the moment, which is 212 kilometres from the ocean. And as you can see behind me, we're starting to get into the gorge country. Now it's here back in the 1920s that men found uh, fossilised shark skeletons in these cliffs that are over 20 million years old. So can you just imagine this whole area been underwater at some stage? It would have been quite incredible. Now before white men came to this area, for 20 to 30,000 years the Aboriginals lived happily all throughout this land. But when the white man did arrive, then things changed in a big way for the indigenous people. So when the white man found this area, they found their beautiful lagoons behind the riverbank there. And then they planted their crops and they, they grew their cattle. They sucked water out of the river to irrigate their land. And all of this moved the Aboriginals away. Now for the white man, they would take all their crops and their fish to the market supply river boat here. The problem was, however, the river boat was three or four days away from the markets once they left this particular spot. So usually all their produce went off. And then when the riverboat returned, the farmer would be left with a bill for a payment to dispose of the fish instead of money from the markets for selling the fish. So it was a very hard time and a very hard place to live. However, every time one farmer left, there would always be another that returned to take his place to try his luck. If you ever get to the other side of this lake, I want to show you an Aboriginal cave. However, it's a lot shallower than I thought, and we're only about halfway across, so it'll be a little while still until we get there. That was really unpleasant. Now these caves, I'm not even exactly sure where they are, so I'll take a walk around, see if I can find them if I can, and I'll give you all a look inside. What I'm trying to do is find the Punyalaroo Caves, but I really have no idea where they are and the map that I have is not real good. It's very, very hot and there's bull ants everywhere and I'm just waiting to see a snake. But anyway, the caves that are around here somewhere have two massive logs in it. And the Aboriginal story goes with those is that a man stole a wife from another man many thousands of years ago and he chased her, he took her downstream here on a canoe and the owner of the wife he was so angry that he took caves underground and came up here somewhere. And there was a huge fight and there was thunder and lightning and storms and all sorts of things. Anyway, after the huge battle, the man who had had his wife stolen from him, he had won the fight back and he, he won his wife back and he took her back upstream. And from there, behind he left these two massive spears. 
and somewhere in a cave around here are two huge monstrous logs and they're apparently spears. And there's no way that the logs could have gone into the caves here because it's just too far off the water. And the last flood they had in this area was about three to four thousand years ago. So the Aboriginal story goes that there was a huge fight, a huge battle, there's bull ants everywhere. And after the battle, the men won his wife back, took her back up river and left his spears behind in the cave here somewhere. Yet the cave, I don't know where it is, but apparently it's around here somewhere. So we're gonna go back down to the river, down to the lake, across through the mud again, back to the boat, and then we'll carry on a bit and see if we have more luck or better luck further on up the river. Well, we've just passed Pelican Point and we're about 307 kilometres from the river mouth. Now, this section of the river in the paddle steamer days used to be very busy. And further upstream, the corners start to get very, very windy and twisty and they start to turn back on themselves. Now, the rule of thumb back in the olden days was when you would approach a blind corner in a paddle steamer, you'd give three long toots of your whistle to, to warn oncoming traffic. But another way that a lot of the, the riverboat captains used to do it was if there was birds on the riverbank, Obviously there'd be no paddle steamer to scare them off, so they'd just keep on going, they wouldn't slow down. And if the birds would fly off, or they'd see them, see the river bank empty and bare of birds, they'd assume that something was coming and they'd slow down. It may not be a good way to do it, but certainly a lot of the riverboat captains back in the paddle steamer days used to do it that way. Now we're also in what is known as a bunyip country. Now there's been no real sightings of what was once thought to be a bunyip since the locks were put in in about 1870s. Um, but before that it wasn't uncommon as far up as this to see fur seals and seals from the ocean. And even back at Manham, which is 150 kilometres back and 150 kilometres from the ocean, you could see dolphins occasionally. And also, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an irregular thing to see people standing on the riverbank spearing garfish, mullet and salmon. So, um, hopefully, the bunyip they talk about was a fur seal, but who really knows? Now we're here at the wharf St Morgan now, 320 kilometres from the ocean. And this area was known as the Great Northwest Bend, as the river so far as we've been travelling has been flowing in a southerly direction. And it's here it turns right angles and heads towards the Kosciuszko National Park, which is about 2,000 kilometres from this point. Now Morgan at one stage had the greatest and busiest port in the whole of South Australia. But that was until the railways came, for when they did, they took pretty much all the work away from these wharfs with them. But as its busiest time, these wharfs here, they had up to 24 paddle steamers a week visiting her. And they had men working on 24 hour shifts just to keep up with the demand. Now the paddle steamers that left these wharfs would carry anything from general cargo to flour, wheat and sugar. And then whatever else the people along the riverbanks needed to live with. And they say that everything that went anywhere came from these wharfs, went to these wharfs, or pass through them. But as I said, once the railways made it to this town, the wharfs here went from about 40,000 tonnes of produce a year, transporting them out, moving things around, to zero. As everyone was choosing the railway, for it was cheaper and a lot, lot quicker. And another thing about these wharfs is they're about 60 or 70 metres long at the moment. But they used to be twice the size. Half of it's been set fire to, half of it's fallen down, and the other half a few years ago 
got taken away by huge floods. Now they say that when these wars were at their busiest, and there was men running all over the place backwards and forwards. There was a select bunch of people that would sit here, relax and drink their alcohol. But to get into that gang, what you had to do was climb to the top of this crane, swing it out over the water and then dive in head first and not die. Now they say that a lot of people wanted to be in this gang, a lot of people wanted to sit here and drink their alcohol, but so are here, there wasn't actually that many people that did. On the bank to the right here, we have a cattle station which um, is called Northwest Bend Station. Now when it was at its biggest in the early days, the size of the actual property was 1,600 square kilometres. It was huge and it had on it 94,000 sheep, 500 cattle and about 300 horses. But then back in the 1860s it had a huge drought and um, 15,700 sheep died just because of lack of water. And the ones that didn't die because of the lack of water actually died by the packs of wild dogs that used to roam all throughout this area. So it was a huge, huge loss to the property. Now, just on my right there in the bush a little way is a small town named Cadell. It was back in 1952 that the South Australian government and the Morgan Council joined forces to make a correctional centre for prison reform. Now, apparently what I've read is everybody's very happy with the program, they've had a lot of success and everyone's very proud of what they've accomplished. The whole centre has river frontage of about 424 hectares, so it's quite a big place. But like I said, everyone that has anything to do with it is, is very proud of what they do there. But it'd certainly be easy for someone to help me. However, we're just going to go up in the bank here over a bit of a hill and I'll show you something just in there a bit. Now there was a sheep and cattle station around this area somewhere that was 1,250 square miles in size. And the incredible thing about that is that the, the man that owned the property that leased it off the government paid only 25 cents per square mile for it. But well before that, the Aboriginals roamed throughout this land and they gathered, ate, and lived without too much trouble at all. But sooner or later, the white men arrived and with that came bigger and better ideas. Or so they thought. So the idea was that back in the last decade of the 19th century, when the depression was on, the government sent out people all throughout this land to help establish new settlements. And they were given things like food, tools and a horse to get this self started. Now some people survived that here, living in tents on the riverbank, but sadly, some did not. For you see, for so many people, when they arrived here, their dreams and hopes and illusions were instantly shattered. For there's nothing but dry, hard, stony dirt. Now some people survived and they lasted their time out here, putting up with the bugs, the bull ants and the flies, and the mosquitoes, but some did not. For some, thought their only way out of this whole place, this whole area, was by committing suicide.
Now we're at Overland Corner here, and just about 10 minutes walk from this spot is the Overland Hotel. Now that's historically listed. When we get up there, I'll tell you a very interesting story about it. Now Overland Hotel is located at Overland Corner, and it's a place that has a very interesting history to it. You see, one of the visitors to this hotel, that now has been lovingly restored, was one of Australia's most famous bush rangers, Captain Moonlight. Now Captain Moonlight was an Irish-born child who was born with the name of George Scott, but he also went under the names of Preacher Scott, or as I said, Captain Moonlight. Now the name Preacher Scott was given to him simply because Captain Moonlight was a lay preacher in the small town just east of here in Victoria. But in his spare time, the preacher would turn his hand to bank robbing. Now in 1878, Captain Moonlight stopped at the Overland Hotel here whilst he was running from the New South Wales and the Victorian police. And when he entered the bar of the hotel, he demanded that they keep both the front and the rear doors left wide open so that he could make a fast getaway if the police arrived. And apparently, word had got around before this time that Captain Moonlight was a very dangerous man and in some ways mentally unstable. And it was because of this that nobody argued with him about the doors being left open. So it was right here at this very hotel at Overland Corner in New South Wales, in a hotel with an average wall thickness of 1.5 metres, that Captain Moonlight sat and drank with both the front and the back doors wedged wide open and ready for him, just in case the need arose for a fast getaway. And to make things even more exciting, apparently he didn't even get off his horse. He would just ride right on in and up to the bar and then order his drink, horse and all. And then one day when he was asked why he didn't leave his horse outside, he just snarled and said, it never hurts to be prepared. Well, it's first thing in the morning on day seven at the moment, and we're here in a place called Devlin's Pound. Now, this area got its name after a huge Irishman that used to run a shanty pub in this area named Patrick Devlin. But he, came, he became famous not so much because of his alcohol, but more of his, of his uh, extracurricular activities. You see, what he did, he would work hand in hand with the cattle rustlers, and he'd liquor up all the stockmen and keep them busy, while the cattle rustlers then took their pick and took their choice of the best stock in the herds. Now eventually people caught on with this and one night Devlin went missing. And then a few months after that people started to see sightings in the trees of this huge Irishman which is the same as what Devlin was. And what was unmistakable was this huge silhouette of a beard. And Devlin was the only person in the whole area who looked like this. So then more weeks went by, more months and more years and apparently from time to time people would see this silhouette in the trees and they would also, on still nights, they would hear a scream coming from the paddock and if the stockmen were in the area and they could go and check on their herds they would see a, a huge silhouette of a man on a big white horse screaming and running through the paddocks stirring up all the mobs of cattle and sheep. Now, in about the 1920s an uh, anthropologist from Adelaide was in this area looking for Aboriginal remains and he dug up a, an unmarked coffin and in it was a huge, the huge remains of a man. And what was mis well, the only part that was, that was recognisable in this coffin was the hair of this man's beard, which was red. So they think that it might have been Devlin. And when they stayed a little closer, there was one single bullet hole in the man's skull. So it's obviously been murdered. But still, that's the story of Devlin. I'm not sure who was in the grave, who was in the coffin. But certainly there's many, many reports of a huge man with a silhouette of a beard standing in the trees looking over campfires and, and even now still people can hear screams coming from their paddocks and the, the cattle and sheep have been, been spooked so I'm not sure who it is or who it was but Devlin's certainly still in this area somewhere. Now just behind me here when the boat swings around a little bit you should better see a small creek and that's called uh, Chambers Creek. Now, I was hoping today to go up there about 10 kilometres in the trail craft, but unfortunately there's just not enough water so I can't travel up there at all. And there's not even enough water for the small Quicksilver Inflatable. But if I had have managed to get up there, we would have found a huge lake called Lake Bonnie. And the water surface area of that's about 5 miles by 3.5, so it's a huge big area. Now that was first discovered back in 1838 by Charles Bonnie, and he was the first overlander to track with stock from 
uh, Sydney to Adelaide, and that's a distance of about 1,600 kilometres. So it's a huge effort, and he was very lucky and very thankful to find Lake Bonnie when he did, for apparently his stock hadn't had water for about a week, a week and a half at that stage. But now it's enjoyed all, enjoyed all year round by people water skiing, boating, and uh, fishing. So it's a very popular place for tourists. Now back in the 18... Uh, 1860s and Mr. Donald Campbell he attempted to break the world speed record there on water in his jet powered boat called the Bluebird. Now to do that he had to get up to speeds of 260 miles an hour which is incredibly quick but unfortunately because of bad weather conditions he, he never broke the record. But still today Lake Bonnie there it's a beautiful spot to, to visit apparently but just unfortunately there's not enough water for us to get up there so I can show you at home. But if you're in the area definitely check it out because it's a great spot. I'm on a stretch of river at the moment called the Seven Mile Reach and it's called that simply because it's the straightest section on the river and it goes straight for a distance of about seven miles like the name suggests and it's certainly a nice change to go straight for a while after having so many twists and turns and bends for the last 460 kilometres. The only problem is however with having such a long straight stretch of seven miles and at the moment I've got a headwind the whole way it gives me seven miles of chop to go through. But anyway, it's still nice to go straight for a while. town up here to my left is a small town of Berry, and back in 1910 it was first thought to be a fine spot to establish an irrigation regime. So then just a year later it was first settled. But now it has over 4,000 hectares of irrigated orchards and vineyards, and it produces over 7,000 tonnes of dry fruit a year, and well over 40,000 tonnes of fresh grapes, uh, citrus fruit and vegetables. And uh, if you like your wine, there's a place just up the river a little bit called the Berry Estate Winery. And there they produce over 7 million litres of wine a year. So I guess if you like your wine, then there is the place to be. It's been about 42 kilometres since we left the small town of Berry, uh, just down the river a bit there, and we're now coming into the very popular tourist town of uh, Renmark, which if you look on your map is in a roundabout way right in the corners of New South Wales, South Australia and Victoria. Now this town is where the first irrigation project in Australia was implemented, and it was done so by two Canadian brothers, a George and a Charles Chaffee. That was back in uh, 1895. Now the name they had going for the scheme at the time was the Renmark Irrigation Scheme. But unfortunately, that whole project went bankrupt. But because the locals could see such a benefit to what the brothers had started, they bonded together and started their own, their own irrigation scheme, which was called the Renmark Irrigation Trust. 
Um, but if I can find somewhere to park the trail craft up here, we'll stop and take a walk into town and I'll show you a little bit around the place because it's a very interesting spot. Now this first place that we see here is the original building used by the Jaffe brothers in the 1890s. And it was here that the two brothers went about designing and building everything that was needed to bring irrigation to life here in Renmark. And it was by using all the natural resources that were found around the area. That logs were cut along with stone blocks that were carved to be used for the building's floor. And then step by step and log by log and stone by stone the Jaffish Brothers house was built. Now the finished product and the original pump that the Jaffe Brothers designed is now on display in the main street of Renmark for all to see. You see what this pump would do is suck water from the river and then move it all around the land of Renmark to help irrigate the dry and dusty ground which then helped turn the earth into the valuable and usable soil that the farmers have today. Now the pump that we see is powered by a compound double action steam engine which has itself a 38 centimeter outlet to help move all the water around. Now I don't know what that means exactly but it certainly sounds impressive. But there is one other thing that you must visit here in Renmark if you're ever in the area and it's totally free of charge and it's located at the town's visitor and information center and what this is is the PS Industry which is an old steam powered paddle steamer that has been restored back to its beautiful original condition. Now the PS Industry was originally designed and built to help unsnag the Murray River. You see for years you could hardly travel any distance through the water without hitting snags or submerged logs and it was then that vessels like this one here would travel through the river pulling out logs and debris to help make the water safe and clear of dangers for other boats and paddle wheelers. So they could use the river and help open up the area for trade and settlement. But that wasn't all this great paddle steam was used for. For after her time had come and there was no more snags to pull. She was then used as a tow boat and later on a construction platform to help build all the locks and the weirs along the river here. Now we're just upstream from Renmark and this whole area is called Chewilla in the Aboriginal language. If you translate that into English it means place of mystery and death. So uh, just to be on the safe side and since I'm all alone I don't think I'm going to stop here. We're just coming up to lock six now and as you can see behind me we're going really really slow for about the last four or five kilometers we've had really shallow water so i got the engine trimmed right up so just the props in the water and now uh, we're trying to chug along at this speed now the depth i'm not sure how shallow it is because i've got no depth sounder but what i've been doing if i've got a spare second is i've got this big depth pile which is just a broom handle and i stick it in see if I can touch the bottom. At the moment I can't so that's pretty good. But for a long while there we kept hitting at about depth height so it's very very shallow. Now the temperature, I just dropped the thermometer but it was reading 46 degrees. So it's awfully hot. We're going very very slow and the water's very shallow but anyway after lock six which is just up here hopefully uh, things should improve a fair bit. Well, as you can see, we've made it to lock six. Now, the weirs in the locks here are very interesting to look at. And to my left, what you can see is the weir, which holds the water back. But to my right is the lock, which uh, allows the water level to go up and down, depending on whether you need to go from downstream to up or from upstream to down. Now, in my case, I'm going upriver. So in the morning, the lock master will open the gates to my right, 
allow me to go in and lock him behind me. I then grab a whole bunch of ropes that he'll throw to me and he'll open the far gates which allows the water to come in. The water in the lock then, then rises up, he opens the front gates and I travel out and all's good. And the same would happen in reverse if I was going down river. But the locks are very interesting, they're very practical and they get a lot of use every year. So this part of the river is called Bunyip Reach and it was back in December 1863 that Captain William Randall was taking the steam paddle boat along this part of the river and she was called the Bunyip. Now it was here somewhere that the front of the Bunyip caught on fire and huge flames arose in front of the wheelhouse. Now Captain Randall to try and save the vessel what he did was to turn the whole lot away from the wind to try and control the flames but this didn't help too much and soon the, the whole wheelhouse was caught on fire. So Captain Randall then jumped into the water to try and save his own life. Now the bunyip was towing two barges at the time. And what happened when Randall jumped into the water was the two barges ran over him. Now it wasn't too good for him as you can imagine, but he did survive. But the bunyip was a total loss and so were the two barges. And unfortunately six men aboard the vessel that day drowned also. Now we've just crossed the 636 kilometre mark, which now puts us into Victoria and out of South Australia. And over the last nine days, we've been using the charts out of this book here called the May River Pilot. And they've been very good, very helpful, and very easy to follow. But now we have to swap and start using the charts out of this book, out of the May River charts. And it's the charts from here that take us into the far reaches of outback New South Wales and Victoria. And it's very isolated out there and we have to take more fuel, more water and more food. Because uh, the river changes a lot, it gets a lot more shallow. And there's more snags, more rock ledges and uh, more sandbars. But anyway, we'll keep on going because there's still plenty more stories to tell you. And now we've crossed the border of New South Wales and South Australia. So South Australia is left behind us now and all we have in front of us for the next uh, 1500 kilometres is Victoria on the right hand side of the river and New South Wales on the left. We're back into another shallow section now, just across the uh, New South Wales, South Australian border. And if you can follow all these coloured boards, then you're doing better than I am. So you see there's plenty of them, so I'm just going to have to go nice and steady, use my depth pole and see how I go. It's a 
the deep section, so we're alright for the moment. Let me just go around these red ones up here, and we should be okay for a while, I think. Again. Even worse, I can't really lift the engine trim any further up than what it is or they'll probably be out of the water. Very shallow and that felt like rock then instead of sand. So now apparently I had to keep over Black map to go right over to the bank here on the right hand side. It's certainly going to be a slow trip if we have to do it at this pace. A bit of slow than not at all. We've got a deep section again now, so that's okay. But before, when it was touching, it was about here on the stick. And if you take up a bit of engine space and a bit of the bottom of the boat, a bit of the keel, and how much water the boat needs for its draft here, I've probably only got about that much water 50 centimetres under the boat and under the prop so it's certainly, you could stand up here and walk right across the river so I wouldn't mind some more water at all, that'd be quite good Deep again. Got about 100 metres to go, I think, and then we should be right. So I'm hoping that it gets deeper from here on in. Well, I think we're right now for a little while. We've passed all the markers. So with a bit of luck, we should be able to pick up some speed now for a few kilometres. So, uh, we'll just pull the dinghy in. And then we should be right for a while, I think. Gotta be an easy way to do that, you'd reckon. Anyway, let's carry on.
you're wondering what I do every night when it gets dark and the sun goes down. I usually just sit here like this and go through my maps and my charts on the area of the river I'm going to cover the next day. Now for tea sometimes I cook something but usually not because I've got 250 litres of fuel below the floor, 20 litres down here in front of my feet, another 60 litres on the back near the engine so I'm not a real fan of lighting up a naked flame anywhere around me at the moment. So for tea tonight the same as last night, I got myself two sandwiches. And this one's brown bread for healthy reasons. Well, in it there's um, uh, mushroom, carrot, broccoli, cheese, and uh, um, strawberry jam. So it's very, very tasty. For dessert, I have a wagon wheel. And the whole course was prepared using a Leatherman, so you can't go wrong. And to wash the whole lot down, I have a cool glass of... Oh, nice. Of milk. So, you can't ask for much more, really. I keep this door shut at night to keep the river rats out, so I don't want them waking me up and disturbing me. Other than that, I couldn't really ask for much more. Oh, nice. Well, this will give you a bit of an idea on where I've slept for the last 10 nights and where I'm going to sleep for about the next 20 if all goes to plan. And that's the beauty of these Trailcraft sports cabs. There's Heaps of room up the front. We've got two bunks which two grown people can easily lie down on and stretch out, or you can fill in the infill and have a huge double bed. It's certainly great, it's very, very comfortable, and um, I have no trouble sleeping at all. Um, if you're wondering what this thing is, it's one of those new state of the art patch to keep away mosquitoes. Now, I don't know whether it's going to work, I only just stuck it on, but we'll soon find out and I'll let you all know in the morning. But um, that's it. Up the front of a trial craft sports cab. They're great places, very comfortable, and uh, I highly recommend them. Well, I'll see you in the morning. Now back in. 1924, a young shearer came across from New Zealand to try and get some work at the age of just 23 years old. And unfortunately, he did this in the middle of the Great Depression. So he had a lot of trouble finding some work and earning some money. Then to make things worse, one night he had all his money and his papers stolen from the boarding house that he was staying at. Now this young man's name was David Jones, but to his friends, they just called him Possum. Now with no money, he then couldn't pay for his union workers ticket, which meant he couldn't get a job. So because of all this, he then became disillusioned and turned his back on society and went to live on the riverbanks here. So for 50 years, Possum roamed between Renmark and down the river a little bit and then Wentworth about 60 kilometres upstream. He lived on the riverbanks um, in old hollowed out logs and under dead trees. He mostly kept to himself and away from crowds. They say that Possum was a shy man who did no harm to anybody. The farmers would often find their wood chopped or their fences mended in exchange for a newspaper that went missing or maybe a box of matches. Now for food, what Possum lived off was the same type of things as the Aboriginals, which would have been uh, rabbits and fish, the odd cat, and honey from the wild bees that lived in the trees. So this man, David Jones, he was found about two weeks after he had died, back in 1982. And his body was found slumped over an old log overlooking the river. And now his headstone is in a property around here somewhere, and it simply reads, 
at rest where he roamed. And Possum, he was 82 years old when he died. I've just made it through Loch Tenor, we're now about 832 kilometres from the Mays River mouth. And uh, we have coming up a short on our left, the town of Wentworth. But before we get there, we can see behind me that we have a junction of the river. Now to my right we have the Murray, and to my left we have the Darling. Now the Darling gets most of the water from the monsoonal downpours in the mountain range in northeast and New South Wales and southern Queensland. Um, when the whole area floods, it makes for one huge gigantic inland ocean. But from this point here, the Darling stretches inland through some of the driest parts of Australia for up to 1900 kilometres. And back when it was full of water and it was a very busy and popular place for the paddle steamers, it wasn't uncommon to see up to 92 paddle steamers a year travelling up and down the river, uh, carting wool, uh, carting wood, wool and general produce and stores for the people that lived along the banks. Now back in the 1890s, Wentworth had the largest inland river port in Australia and a mail network that covered all of western New South Wales which includes runs from Wentworth to Melbourne, Adelaide to Wentworth along the Murray, Wentworth to Sydney and from Wentworth all the way up along the Darling River via Burke which is an incredibly huge distance to travel and all of it was done on horseback or with a horse and cart. And the wharfs at Wentworth were the meeting place for all the steamboat crews the graziers, roustabouts and shearers, and as well for pretty much everybody else that lived or worked in or around the town of Wentworth. Bullock teams hauled in wool from all around the countryside to be loaded aboard the steamboats and their barges, and supplies were loaded and unloaded to be taken up and down the rivers Murray or Darling to help supply the people that lived along their banks. And around the wharfs here, it wasn't unusual for the area to be shipping out over 12,000 bales of wool a year and well over one million pounds of export. But today, the town has a lot of other things to offer now, like their beautiful old schools, the town's jail, parks, sanctuaries, and the old, but still used, town courthouse. Now before we leave Wentworth altogether, it's worth taking another look at the Darling River. You see, it was here at a tree just like this one, about 700 metres upstream from the junction of the two rivers, that Captain Charles Sturt anchored up his wild boat on the 23rd of January 1830 and gave the Murray River her name. And he named it after a Sir George Murray, who was at the time Secretary of the State of the Colonial Office. We're just upstream from Wentworth now and we've pulled into the town of Mildura. Now either the people here receive about 4,000 hours of sunshine a year, so already this place sounds like a pretty good spot to me. Now, it was back in 1847 that a man by the name of Frank Jenkin swam his cattle across the river here from the New South Wales side to the Victoria side and then set up camp there. And the land he did this on was known as the Yerry Yerry. But because he had no license to do so, he was then forced back uh, to the New South Wales side by the rightful owner a man by the name of Hugh Jensen. But soon after that, the land known as the Jerry Jerry became the, the very popular town of Mildura. And from that moment on, it just started to grow. This is a recreation of the original homestead built here in Mildura 
in about the 1880s. If you take away all the nice green grass, add about a million flies, half a million rabbits, the isolation, the heat and the dust, then you'll have some idea what it would have been like living here when this homestead was first originally built. Well, it seems we've got a slight problem. You see, I was just talking to one of the lock guys at Lock 11 here at Middle Jura, and uh, he tells me that the river has no more water in it. So what we're going to have to do is pull the boat out of the water, pull the trail craft out, stick it on the back of the Nissan, and travel about 742 kilometres upriver back to Turumbri where there's more water. You see, the, we've had water so far because of the locks, and the locks are there, as I said before, to help regulate the water and keep a constant flow. The locks are only good for about 40 kilometres upstream, then the river starts to look and run at its natural state, and at the moment we're in the middle of a huge drought. So um, after our next lock, which is just near Robinvale, which is lock 15, we have a stretch of about 505 kilometres to Turumbri, and there's absolutely no water at all in there. So as I said, we're going to pull the trail craft out, uh, head across the land, follow the river still. We're still going to go through all the stores I mentioned before, got a whole lot more things to cover just for the next 500 kilometres, the next 700 kilometres, thereabouts, it's going to be in the Nissan. Now we've just left Mildura and we're heading towards Swan Hill. And on the way there, we have to go through a town called Red Cliffs. And it's there I'd like to introduce you to one huge lady, and her name's Lizzie. So when we get there, I'll pull up to the side of the road and I'll let you have a look at the size of her. So this is Big Lizzie, and she was built back in Melbourne in 1919 by a man named Frank Bottrell. And he set out to build a machine that wouldn't get stuck in the sand. So the magic thing about Big Lizzie are these huge steel beams and what they're designed to do is lay on the surface of the ground on the sand and the whole machine would then roll forward and roll over the top of it and not sink and get stuck. Now they're on the front wheels, on the back wheels and back on the trailer. And Big Lizzie here at top speed was travelling at just two miles an hour. We've just pulled off the highway after going through the small town of uh, Caligden. And I would have shown you what was back in that town, except there was nothing there. There was one shop. Now, the town of Caligden and the town a little further back called Nagelok, there's an interesting story about those two towns. So when I pull up over here a little bit, I'll tell you about it. Now, as the story goes, one of the two towns was settled first, but no one knows really which one it was. Now, one of the residents in the first town had an argument with one of the other residents and he stormed off and started up his own community just up river a little bit or down. Now, just to spot the other end of the argument, he started up his own town and named it the same as the first town, only the name was back to front. So, for example, uh, Nanjulik, which is spelled N-A-N-G-I-L-O-C, when you spell it backwards, it reads out Kaligden, which is the other town just down the river a little bit. And when you read out Caligden, it spells Nangilic, which is N-A-N-G-I-L-O-C, but backwards. So no one really knows which town was first, whether that story is true or not, but all the same, it's pretty interesting.
Right, well, we're finished here, so we'll head off to Swan Hill before it gets dark. In the morning, I'll show you a little around there. Now I've just turned off the Murray Valley Highway, I'm on a bit of a dirt track now which goes for about 6 or 7 kilometres so the signpost says back there. When we get to the end here we should be able to see the junction where the Murrumbidgee River comes out and joins into the Murray. So this is the Murrumbidgee River behind me, and as you can see she's a little bit smaller than the Murray. However, it looks can be deceiving. For you see, the Murrumbidgee starts flowing some 900 kilometres inland, way up in the Snowy Mountains, which is part of the Australian Alps. She flows all the way down here, then all the way down to Gula will be started, which is over 1,200 kilometres away. So, how's this for a spot then? Now this whole area is called Good Night, and it got its name because of one particular drover that used to live just up in the riverbanks here a little bit. Now he couldn't speak any English, except for one word, which was Good Night. So when the paddle steamers would come past, when there was a lot more water obviously, and people would come down and use the river, and the drovers would come and water their cattle or sheep, they would get greeted by this particular driver with the word Good Night. And whether it was morning, night, lunchtime, it made no difference whatsoever. The same greeting would always be the same, the only word that this man knew. Which is how this place got its name of a good night. And just around the corner is a place called the Bitch and Pup, so we'll head around there and I'll, I'll show you just upstream a little bit. You should be able to see behind me here if you have a closer look, the rock's starting to stick out of the water. And this is the start of the Bitchin' Pups. Now this whole section of river, for kilometres and kilometres and kilometres upstream, starts to get very shallow and very rocky on the bottom. Now those rocks behind me, if you had another week or two with no rain, which is more than likely what's going to happen, they'd probably be a foot or two out of the water. So you can see it's a perfect example on why uh, I couldn't take the boat any further up from Mildura and I had to take it back out downstream. Very dangerous. We're about halfway along the Murray now and about halfway between the ocean and the mountains and we're just pulling into the very popular and thriving town of Swan Hill, which is located at about the 1400 river kilometre mark on the map. Now uh, Swan Hill was named by Major Mitchell on the 20th of June in 1838 on his trip along the Murray and it was when he camped on a sand hill for the night just nearby here somewhere that he was kept awake all through the night by the black swans on a, on a rise just west of his campsite and it was that rise that he named Swan Hill which is the area that the town is located in today. Now the first thing that you must visit when you arrive in the town of Swan Hill is the famous Birk and Willis tree, which is located near the centre of town. For this tree now stands at over 27 metres in height and has a branch span of around 44 metres. You see, this tree 
which is a Morton Bay fig, was planted by Burke and Wills in the front garden of the local doctor's house before they set off on the second leg of the real fated expedition across Australia. A trip which ended the lives of both Burke and Wills and five other men. It was a trip that started them in Melbourne and was to end up in the Gulf of Carpentaria, right up the top of Australia. It was a trip that started out with 16 men and two years supply of food, 80 pairs of shoes, beds, hats and buckets, and was to be the first expedition to cross the continent of Australia on foot, which was something that had never been done before by the white man. But it was a trip that ended in peril. You see, further north, once the group had passed the Darling River, the expedition set up base camp at Cooper's Creek, and it was there that they were to wait for more supplies. However, Burke became impatient, and himself, Wills and two other men set off deciding to worry about the supplies when they returned back to camp. But incredible conditions and intense heat day after day took a toll on the four men, and on their return from the Gulf of Carpentaria, in which they reached in February 1861, they arrived one man short, having lost one of their companions, a Mr Gray, along the way. However, when they again reached their base camp at Cooper's Creek, they had found that the rest of their party had already left, just one day before them themselves had arrived. But the party had buried supplies for the men under a tree at the camp, and they had marked the spot by carving the word dig into the tree, thinking the men would easily find the supplies, but sadly they did not. Having Grey die on the return journey from the Gulf, Burke, Wills and King survived for another two months at the site of Cooper's Creek, having never found the food and the water left to them by their party. Firstly, it was Will that died and then Burke, and it was during Burke's final hours when he became too weak to stand that he then asked King to leave him and place his pistol in his hand, and he then left this note scrawled on a piece of paper. King has behaved nobly, and I hope if he lives, he is properly rewarded. King has stayed with me until the last. He has left me at my own request, unburied with my pistol in hand. King eventually wandered off delirious and extremely malnourished, to be taken in by a tribe of Aboriginals, and then to be found on the 15th of September, 1861, by a search party and taken back to Melbourne. Now I've just put into the small town of Barham to show you a few things. And the first thing is this bridge behind me. Now if you have a close look at it, you can see that it's quite an interesting piece of engineering. What it's designed to do is allow the paddle steamers underneath by keeping the bridge relatively close to the ground. You see, the paddle steamers would come down the river behind me, in the olden days, and the water levels would be a lot higher. And when they approached this bridge, the centre section on these huge cables would then lift straight up in the air, the paddles then would pass underneath, would then lower the bridge back down, and they continue using it as normal. It's a very, very good idea, and they're very interesting to look at. So if you ever see one up close, take a good look, and, and you'll be quite impressed. So this next place up here that we're going to stop might give you a bit better of an idea on what it would have been like uh, back in the time when everyone was clearing this land and settling it for the first time. You see, they had to, they had to clear all the trees and once they were fallen, then they had to move them. And to move the huge logs, they used wagons like we see here. And this is called a log buggy. For the loggers would cut the trees down and then cut them up into huge sections like we see here. And then by using huge ramps and pulleys, they would then haul the logs up onto the buggy. They were then taken by bullock teams to a nearby mill. Now before 
before we get too far away from the bridge, I'll explain another thing about it too. Years ago, there was a law passed that said no vessel could go under a bridge at more than four miles an hour. And the problem occurred because the paddle steamer towing a barge downstream, its average speed would be between eight to 10 miles an hour. So we have our paddle steamer here and our barge and our bridge. So the way they got around this was traveling downstream. The captain would get his men to unhook the barge. They then allow it to float past. They take the rope from the front of the barge and the rear of the paddle steamer and transfer it back to front so the barge was in front and the rope was tied onto the back of the paddle, uh, back of the barge, front of the paddle steamer. The captain would then put the paddles in reverse and slow the whole lot down. It would then pass under the bridge at about four miles an hour. They'd get under and then transfer it back to the original way and they'd carry on. Only to get to the next bridge and have to do it all again, undo the ropes, let the barge float past, hook it back on, paddles in reverse, slow down, go under the bridge, transfer it back and carry on again. And this went on around and around and around, no matter how many bridges there were, that's how they had to do it. Now this place here is called Cemetery Bend, and it's called that because just up there in the bush a little bit is the gravesite of two little girls. You see, there used to be a mill in this area in around the 1880s called the 100 Mile Mill. And it was called that because of its location, which is about 100 miles downstream from Echuca. And the family that ran this mill, it was their two little girls that sadly drowned in the river here. And now, just up on the hill, it's a little white picket fence that now surrounds their graves on such a peaceful part of the river. Now if you're wondering about the forest that I'm driving through, it's called the Gumbawa State Forest. And it's said to be the second largest standing of red gums in the world next to a place just up the river a bit that we'll go to in a few days. Now most of the trees all through here are juvenile younger ones, as the larger ones were cut down years ago uh, for railway sleepers and for other uses along the river for the paddle steamers and such. Um, now to give you some idea on how hard the men in this area worked, a good example is a man by the name of uh, Alexander Arbuthnot, who used to own a, a wood mill in this area in about the 1870s. And apparently he worked so hard that he had to get married on Christmas Day, for that was the only day of the year that he allowed himself off. Well, we're at Tarambri now. We've travelled over 500 kilometres, but we've finally found some more water. So we'll stick the trail craft back in and we'll carry on a bit. <laughs> All right, well, I'm nearly ready. We're just gonna head off to the weir just around the corner. In a second, I'm just pumping up the Quicksilver inflatable boat. And they're great things, these little inflatables. They're easy to blow up, they fit in the boot of your car, and if you don't want to get a 
a big one like the trail craft, you can go for one of these, they can take anything from a two horsepower up to a 15, so they're great things, very easy to use by yourself, very easy for, for uh, teenagers to use and they're great fun, so if you haven't got one and you like boating and you're not sure where to start, Quicksilver Inflatable is a good spot. <laughs> Well, let's go take a look at this weir. Now the Tarumbri Weir is also known as Lock 26, and it's located 1,683 kilometres upstream from the ocean. Now one way to look at all the locks and the weirs in the river, is to look at them like a series of huge stepping stones, placed at different locations along the river, starting way down near the ocean, and going all the way up to the Hume Dam at the base of the Kosciuszko National Park. Now the uses are so very important for the flow of the river. But when there is no rain downstream, then water can be let go from weirs like this one here at Turumbri to help keep the water level sufficient at different parts of the river and to allow a constant and steady water flow to all areas. And then when there is plenty of water, then the water can be withheld so that it is not wasted and allowed to run out into the ocean. The problem is though, when there is no water anywhere, and when the whole country is suffering from drought conditions, that is when the management of the river's water and the operation of weirs like this one here at Turumbri become very, very important. And one of the great things here at Lock 26 is the fish ladder that the weir has built into it. But what this allows the fish to do is find their way up through the weir so that they can breed and live at all locations along the river. For the fish, swim up the ladder as they are attracted to the running water and then into the holding cage. From there the introduced species can be disposed of and the river's natural fish can then be counted and released to then continue on on their way. Now we've just pulled the trail craft up on the side of the river here and I'm going to put the dinghy in and take you all in to see a place called Cow Swamp Inlet and that was used by the Aboriginals over the last 20,000 years so it's really worth taking a look at. So we'll put the inflatable in, put on the 15 horse and go for a spin.
They're about five kilometres downstream from Machuca, and this area of river is very popular with the houseboat. Now, if you have been on a houseboat, then you know how great they are and how much fun they can be had. But if you haven't, and you're not sure what they're like inside, then take a look at this. So we have just up here to my right the town of Echuca and we're 1,713 kilometres from the river mouth so we're starting to certainly get the mine up a bit now. Now Echuca was shaped by the pastoralists because back in the day it was part of a huge station which was over 30,000 hectares in size which had uh, sheep and cattle on it. Now the name of Echuca comes from the Aboriginal word meaning uh, meaning of waters as it's located near the junctions of the Murray, the Goulburn and the Campsby rivers. Now, um, at one stage when it was at its busiest, the town had the biggest, uh, biggest port and the biggest um, jetty in the southern hemisphere. And you really have to see it to believe it in person. For the size that it is now, which is huge, it was actually five times that size when, when the town was in its full hustle and bustle. So it's certainly worth taking a look at this jetty. So that's Echuca, and it certainly is a great place to visit. However, we can't forget about Moema, the town on the other side of the river. Well, hang on. Wasps. We don't want those on board. Now, Moema was originally located two kilometres upstream from where it is at the moment. It was washed out and ruined by floods twice, once in 1867 and once in 1870. So it was moved to the higher ground where it sits today. But the worst of those two floods was the 1870 flood. And the water level there reached levels 13 metres higher than the average summer level, so it was a huge amount of water. Oh, and the name Moema, that comes from the Aboriginal word meaning place of the dead. And that's because of all the unmarked grave sites spread out all throughout the town. You see, when they moved the town, they put it on a hill nearby to help keep it out of future floods. The hill they put it on was actually an Aboriginal burial ground.
Now, if you're wondering what happened to the river and what happened to the trial craft, well, we, we ran out of water just a little way back. We got just up near Barma, just up from Echuca, and the water levels got just too low to continue on. So now I'm back in the Nissan, and we're heading towards a place called um, the Narrows. And it's called that because this stretch of the river gets a whole lot more narrow than the rest of it. And the river banks are very, very low, also compared to what we've seen uh, in the past. And the reason it's so low is because this part of the river is very new compared to the rest of it. You see, the water used to travel way inland at one stage, but because of the, the way the land has changed and the contours of the land have, have formed over the last couple of thousand years, the river's had to take a, a new course, and that new course that it took is the one we're travelling on now. And because the river banks are so new and so low, that means that the first sign of flood, the water rises up and flows over the banks and spreads out all throughout this land. And it means that, um, apparently, so I've read that there's water as far as the eye can see. So the forest we're in is called the Barma State Forest, and we have the Milua on the other side of the river. And the interesting thing about these two forests is that you can find flora and fauna here that's usually only found in areas with three times this place's annual rainfall. Um, but this whole area gets away with it because of the huge floods they receive, or used to receive. You see, the problem is now, the floods don't come anymore. Now just to give you all a bit of useless information, the Murray's thought to be the second most windy river in the world, with a distance from the ocean to the sea by river three times that compared to what it would be driving in a car. And it's also thought to be the slowest river in the world, with a fall rate from Warbury all the way down to within 160 kilometres from the ocean at just 15 centimetres for every kilometre. So it's certainly not much. Then for the last 160 kilometres all the way down to the ocean, the fall rate's only 2.5 centimetres for every kilometre. So with a fall rate like that, you can certainly understand why the river is thought to be the slowest flowing in the world. Now you see groups of old logs like this all over the place around here. And they're here for one of two reasons. The first reason is the loggers would come through and they'd see a, a group of trees like this, so close to the river, great location, and easy to transport to the barge, which then would take them downstream. The other reason is the paddle steamers would come through and they'd run out of wood. And they'd need huge amounts of wood to restock their boilers. So they'd pull up, cut them down, restock their load, and then carry on. Now the paddle steamers would use up to one ton of wood every hour. And sometimes they'd be working for 12 hours at a time. So it's a huge amount. Or another way to look at it is they would use roughly six tons of wood for every 16 kilometers traveled. So there's reasons for the, the paddle steamers and the loggers and the, the popularity of the railway that came through all throughout Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland about the same time, that forests like these on both sides of the river really became totally extinct and wiped out completely. So the paddle steamers would travel up and down the river taking wool, general cargo and wood, which made it sometimes very hard for the loggers to get their, their wood transported to another location because of the lack of the paddle steamers. So to get around this, what they would do was, was the paddle steamers would leave behind a barge. The loggers would then fill it up, push it out in the river, and let it float down with the current. And to keep it in the centre of the channel, they would have this huge long chain that they dragged behind. And because that was so heavy, it would constantly roll and keep it in the centre of the river and in the deep channel. So um, they let off their their barge to float down the river and then when the paddle steamer was free on its way up it would just pick up the barge and then take it back to where it had to go. Now sometimes when the paddle steamers were running low on wood but they didn't want to cut their own cut their own supplies they would look out for these huge log stacks left on the riverbank by the loggers so they could then reload their stack and then carry on. But if the loggers weren't around what would happen is the, the paddle boat captain would let off one huge toot on his horn and that would indicate to the loggers that the paddle steamers have got some wood, but you weren't around, so next time we come back, we'll pay for it then. Now one logger got completely sick of the paddle steamer captains 
taking his wood piles, not paying for them, stealing them. So what he did to get his own back was hide sticks of jelly knot all throughout his wood stacks up and down the river. And then when the paddle steamer captains didn't pay for it, they blew themselves up. That happened twice. There's something just up here on the riverbank a little bit on a tree, a marking. When I can find it, I'll give you a look. We've just put up on the side of the road and we've got a red-bellied black snake down on the track and um, you don't want to ever go anywhere near these because they're very very dangerous but if you see one on the side of the road you can certainly pull your car up if you don't harm it or scare it have a bit of a look and you can learn a lot from them So you see he's not very frightened, he's in pretty good condition, a little skinny, but obviously there's not too much to eat around here when the area's in such a huge drought. But as I said, look at them, but certainly don't touch them. If you see one when you're bushwalking, just stand still. If he's a fair way away, just slowly walk back and he'll slither off. But certainly never try and pick them up. Never prod them with a stick, just leave them alone. All right, let's try and find this tree then. Well, I finally found what I was looking for, but it certainly wasn't easy. Now these trees play an important part in history. You see, before the red mark was put on it, which is put on there so the tree wouldn't be lost over time, it was nicknamed a mile tree. And it had these huge numbers carved into it. And this particular one was tree 260. And the big numbers were for the paddle steamer captain so they could see how far they had to go in distance in miles before they got to Echuca. And like I said, this one was 260 and they were placed every mile apart. So there would have been another 259 of them all the way up the river, all the way to Echuca. Keep your eye out for them, they're pretty good. The token wall's got some other things going for it as well. For example, it's beaches. There's beaches like this all over the place. There's actually 25 within five minutes drive of the township. Now the average sunshine they get every year is around 3,000 hours. And compare that to Melbourne, which gets about 953 hours a year average, this seems like a lot better place to be. Plus there's a beach just up the road a bit called Thompson's Beach. And apparently that's supposed to be Australia's longest inland beach. So, this place has got a whole lot going for it. Well, we've made it to Yarrawonga. And behind me there you can see the Yarrawonga Weir. And then behind that we have Lake Mawalla, which is a huge man-made water catchment area, which is over 6,000 hectares in size, so it's just a huge, massive lake. Now, right now, we're 1,996 kilometres upstream from the river mouth, right down the bottom of South Australia. And we're also 126 metres above sea level, so we're slowly starting up there on the altitude, but soon we'll be a lot further up as we start to head up into the mountains. Now, I had planned to film this whole segment out in the middle of the river, in the trail craft. However, we have a slight problem with the boat ramp, and in just a second, I'll show you that, and you'll understand why now I'm standing on the rocks.
This is Lake Monwalla, and as I said before, it's a huge man-made water catchment area. This whole lake is over 6,000 hectares in size. Now, at one stage, the whole area had to be emptied out so that people could uh, take care of maintenance and do some work on the weir back there. But the real beauty of the place is up here, and you'll see uh, very shortly that the forest and the floodplains that used to be all out of the water, well, they still stand today, except now they're permanently submerged. So how's this? This whole area is just fantastic and as you can see behind me there's thousands of trees all over the place and some of them are more than 600 years old. Now when they flooded this whole area they left the trees here for three reasons. The first reason is it helps keep the erosion down. For as the wind comes blowing across the lake here by having the trees they help slow the wind and in return help keep the wave height down. The second reason is all the old tree stumps and the logs and the branches in the water they help to encourage fish breeding. They have somewhere to live, somewhere to breed and somewhere to hide. And the third reason is the beautiful big branches. And they encourage bird life to come to this area to nest, to live all around these trees. So the whole area is just great. If you have some spare time and you're around here at all, do yourself a favour and take a closer look. Now there is one thing on this trip I haven't tried to do yet, and that's catch a fish. And the main reason for that is that I don't know the first thing about fishing. However, the guy back at the tackle shop in Yarrawonga assured me that if I buy this lure off him, that I'll catch a fish. So, all I know is it's purple, and it rattles. So I'm going to just hook it on this line here and trawl it all the way back to the boat ramp like he suggests and see how I go. I don't like my luck but it certainly looks cool. I'll try it anyway. Fifteen bucks didn't last long.
Now, the first man to ever cross the river here was a man by the name of Charles Bonney, and he did so with 10,000 sheep. Now, can you imagine that? There'd be noise, heat, dust, and an incredible amount of flies. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen a sheep which is like the water. But he got them across, Charles Bonney did, all 10,000 of them, and he did so right here. Well, this is the Hume Weir, and as you can see, it certainly is one massive structure. Now, behind here, we have Lake Hume, which is a man-made water holding facility which holds enough water to fill the Sydney Harbour four times. And all of it is held back by that one huge wall of concrete. Now, all the water that flows through here, along with the, the area's annual rainfall, helps to keep the Murray flowing and helps to supply drinking water and water for irrigation all throughout New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. Well, this is the end of Lake Hume, and as you can see, there's certainly not much water in it at the moment. And that's because we're in the middle of a huge drought, so there's not much that we can do about that. Now, if I was to go from this spot here, back to the weir, and then around the corner a little bit, I get to a small town named Talangatta, which is about 30 kilometres in a straight line, straight over the hills there in front of me. However, if I was to stay exactly where I am, and we fill this whole lake right to the brim, right to the top, and I was to walk right around the edge of the whole place, back to here, it'd then be a distance of about 390 kilometres, which is about the same distance as from here to Melbourne. Now the reason that I've stopped here just out of Koryong on the way up into the mountains is because from this spot here on the 5th of November in the year 2000, an Australian marathon swimmer by the name of Temi Van Wise swam from somewhere around here all the way down to the ocean which is a distance of about 2,438 kilometres. And it was way down there that she ended up and it took 106 days to complete a swim.
Now, 60 million years ago, the Murray started its course out of the side of a mountain. And now it's helped along by tens of hundreds of thousands of small creeks and rivers all throughout New South Wales, South Australia and Victoria. And also it can make its way 2,500 kilometres downstream all the way to the ocean. Now originally she flowed westwards from the Great Dividing Range but then over time as the land masses moved and the contours of the land changed she was forced to take a new path. The pedal boats came and went as the overlanders crossed one of the driest continents on earth, thousands and thousands of kilometres of dry, hot dirt. And they used the river as a precious source to keep themselves and their cattle alive. It provides water for us to drink and quench our thirst, to swim in and enjoy in many, many ways. And it helps give us great pastoral lands that we can grow cattle that give us milk, and many more things we probably all take for granted. And the source of this great river, its very beginnings, is right here. So this is the start of the May River. However, it's not technically the start, you see. It begins 15 kilometres upstream from here, on a small place called Forest Hill. And it begins there as just a small trickle. But this is as far upstream as we can go because of track closures and recent bushfires. But you can certainly see that after just 15 kilometres, the river started to turn itself into one of the greatest rivers in the world. Now you might think that we're finished with the Murray, but there's one last thing I must show you, and I couldn't live with myself if I didn't. But to do that, we have to go right up to the top of Mount Pinibar, which is one of Australia's highest mountains, and then down the other side and past a cattle station called Tom Grogan. Now see if you can remember that name, Tom Grogan, for that station plays a very important part in one of Australia's greatest stories. But as you can see, it's starting to get dark now, so we're going to camp up here somewhere for the night and continue on in the morning. Now if you're wondering where I'm staying tonight, Come and take a look at this, it's a Bushman's Hut in the snowy mountains here, so we'll just go on inside. The first thing we have, quality veranda, beautiful things keep the rain off. Then we go in, fly screen door keeps out the mosquitoes. Now once you're in here, it's a beautiful setup. The first thing is the fire, have that going. Keeps us nice and warm all night. The next we have the dining table here. Then we come across the double glazed glass. So you can see what the weather's like outside. Then we have our two beds. And this one here is very comfortable. It actually has a big tear in the back of it, so I flipped it over before. I think that's probably from the rats, but anyway, it's very nice. So as I said, there's two of those so you can you can bring a guest. Now um the door, quality door, it um, keeps the wild dogs out, beautiful. So if we go outside now, I'll show you what I'm having for tea. So we have the campfire here. Now I'm having, I haven't really decided yet, but we have two options, braised steak and onion, or a hearty sorry stew. So it's nice, so that's where I'm staying tonight. Quality bush cabin. The snow mountains, and they're as, uh, as comfortable as they look. The trees that you can see behind us, they're all called mountain ash. And the reason I'm showing you these is so you can pay attention and see how the tree line changes as we get further up top of the mountain and the higher in the altitude. And the mountain ash, you can tell them apart by their, their dark bark and their, their white coloured trunks in, in various locations. And they're, 
their leaves are like this, beautiful big green leaves, and you can see the light colour vein running through them. And the little nuts and the seeds that they have look like so. Just little round, bally looking things. But anyway, keep an eye on the trees and you'll see soon how everything changes the higher we get up and the colder the climate starts to change to. This is the top of Mount Pinky Bar, and as you can see, we have a beautiful view behind me there. Now the cloud cover is starting to come over, so it's getting cold very quick, so I won't stay up here too long. But if you're wondering how high up we are, well, Mount Kosciuszko, which is Australia's highest mountain, is probably 10 or 15 kilometres straight in front of me there over the mountains. Now her height is 2,228 metres above sea level, and Mount Pinky Bar here is 1,773. So we're not quite as high, but we're certainly starting to get up there. Now you can also see that the landscape has changed dramatically and there's no longer those huge big trees that we had just a moment ago. What we have is something quite a bit different. It's just over here, so we're going to take a look. Now these trees that we have here now are called snow gummers. And as you can see, they're a lot smaller, a lot more bent, a lot more twisted. And that's to help them survive the extreme temperatures up here on the top of these mountains. You see, half the year, they have to spend six months, four months, depending on the season, completely under the snow. They may have two foot of snow, they may have no snow, they may have six foot of snow. But it's their shape and their size and the way that they're designed which helps them survive these extreme conditions. Now if we just have a look here. Their leaves are a lot different as well. They're a lot smaller, they're a lot thicker. Um, everything is completely different about it compared to the trees that we get lower down in the mountains. They're just really fascinating. So if you're ever around here, take a close look and compare the different trees and the different plants because you'll find that Everything is a lot different. Now Andrew Barton Patterson was born on the 17th of February 1846 in a small town in New South Wales called the Rambler. And it was there he grew up until about the age of 10, where he then moved to Sydney for schooling and then later on in life became a qualified solicitor. But through his love for writing he would often submit poetry to the local newspaper, but not under his name but rather under the name of his horse, the Banjo, which is how Andrew Barton Patterson received the nickname of Banjo Patterson. So Banjo became probably Australia's most famous and recognisable author and poet. But probably the most famous piece of work he ever did was a poem called The Man from Snow River. Now remember earlier on when I asked you to try and remember the name of the cattle station Tom Grogan? Well for 30 years a man worked for that station and he lived just across the river here in the hills of New South Wales and he was known as a hermit from Tom Grogan. Now for years this man was known throughout this whole area for his great skill as a stockman, a bushman and a horseman. And he was also a great friend of old Banjo Patterson's who on many occasions would trek right up here into the mountains to visit his friend and to listen to his stories. And the rough bush life took a toll on the hermit from Tong Grogan and after many years he became ill but he refused to leave the mountains for treatment. So his friends came in one day to pick him up and take him out. And they were trying to take him to the Corrie Young Hospital. So his friends loaded him up onto a stretcher and they tried to carry him out over these mountains, but they soon found that it was near impossible over such rugged terrain. So they then put him on his horse. One man sat behind him to keep him upright and two of his friends sat either side to help keep his balance. And they walked mile after mile all throughout these mountains, well into the night as the snow began to fall. And when possible, they would carry their friend on the stretcher again. And then when it became too rough, 
they would put him back on his horse and steady him from either side. And they would do this all the way through the mountains, trying to get their friend to the hospital. Then one night just before dusk, they reached a small tin miner's hut which used to stand exactly where I am now. But all that's left and all that remains now is a small pile of rocks which used to be the chimney and some small holes in the ground which used to hold the wall posts. And it was here that they sat their legend of a friend to try and make him comfortable for the night, give him a drink and they let him sit by the fire. Now they say that during the night this man was in fine spirits, remembering his past and enjoying his memories. However, in the morning this legend of a man had died, and he did so right here. And where this plaque is, and as it reads, Jack Riley, the man from Snow River, died here 14th of July 1914. The original and only man from Snow River. Well folks, I hope you've enjoyed yourself as we've travelled the full length of the Murray River. From all the way down to the bottom of South Australia, straight up the middle and then along the borders of New South Wales and Victoria. It's been a long trip, 2,500 kilometres and it's taken a month. But it's been great fun. So hopefully you've enjoyed yourself and learned something. So until next time, take care, look after yourself and I'm Bill Gray. Average this town gets. A whole lot better option. 126 kilometres. Uh, the the river mouth way down the ocean there in South Australia. The mountains just yet. Now behind the behind the weir. Well, we've made it to Yarrawonga, and we're 1,000. Well, we've made. So we're starting to, starting to get up down the altitude a little bit and we should soon... You see, they, they still live today, except now the lake's... Man-made catchment area, which... Well, we've made it to... Well, we've made it to Yarrawonga, on the river just out of Koryong. Oops. Again. We've stopped here on the river, on the way up into the mountains. And Captain Charles Sturt and seven companions rode down the Murrabidgee. And Captain Charles Sturt. You right, Sturt? <laughs> William Hovel and Hamilton Hume crossed it on a piece of tarpaulin. <laughs> what, what was that? Tarpaulin stretched across a wrinkle. Except tarpaulin stretched across a wrinkle. The first man to ever cross the river here was an air. And theoretically, I should be standing well under the water. However, because we're in the middle of a huge drought, obviously I'm not. Now, for... Now, I'm named Talon. I get to a town named Talon. Okay. When the water levels were at their highest, the level of... My head. When the water levels are at their peak, the level should be. However, when the water levels are at their highest level, at the bottom. So we're at the end of Lake. As you can see, there's certainly not much water in it at the moment. Going a straight line from here, right over the mountains, right over the hills, I get to that little town. Oh. Thousands and thousands of kilometres on one of the driest continents on Earth. 
and they use the waters. Press pause. 16 kilometres downstream from where it starts. How it's certainly. However, after just 15 kilometres, you can see that the, the river is stirred. Oh, again, the recent bushfires. But you can certainly see that after just 15 kilometres, it's quickly. Oh, it also come with the branches. But they grow up here high in the mountains, but you'll, you'll see that. Uh, I pulled one off too. <laughs> yeah. It's just to uh, pay attention to these trees, and I'll show you in just a little while how all the the trees and the fauna and fauna. Fa oh, I shouldn't have said that. How do you pronounce it? They're a lot smaller. They're a lot more twisted, and they're a lot more rugged to extend to um with um blizzards and snow. See, half the year, all these uh, two foot of snow, six foot of snow, depending on the on you know on the on the weather. Just across the river here, on the New South Wales border. And he was known. I remember before, when I tried to... Really? Is that right? I remember a little earlier. I remember earlier on. Oops. Now many years in the mountains took a toll on the hermit from Tom Grogan. Oops. He came in again and his condition worsened. And then took him by hook. No, that's good. Very impossible. So they then loaded him up into his horse. One friend. Oh. They tried to carry their friend in a stretcher. Hang on. These mountains. Well into the night. Then the rain began to fall. They soon found that it was near impossible because of the rugged terrain. Hang on. Ow. Now for years this man was known throughout this whole earth. So his friends loaded him up onto a stretcher. And I... Now one night just before dusk they reached the you know? But all that remains now is a bunch of small rocks which used to... On dust they reached a small tin miner's hut, which, tin miner's hut, which used to... What remains now is a small pile of rocks which used to be the chimney and some small post holes, post holes in the ground. One night just before dust they reached a small tin miner's hut. Which, I don't know why I can't say that. And there remains is just a small pile of rocks which used to be the old chimney and holes in the ground which used to be the... One night, just on dusk, there is a small tin miner's hut, yeah. which tin miner's, yeah. tin miner's hut, which used to stand exactly where we are now. But all that now remains. So then, one night on dusk. Oops. Well, folks, I hope. Well, folks, I hope. And the Southern Ocean, right up. Well, folks, I hope you've enjoyed the show. As we've travelled from... It's been a long trip. It's taken me 30 days exactly. But I've had fun and I hope you've learned... Well, folks, I... I've been gone three weeks on the Southern Ocean. Went right up through the state. Well, folks, I hope you've enjoyed the show. As we've travelled from right down the bottom of the Southern Ocean. Off concrete. Now, all the water that flows through here, along with the Murray's annual rainfall, helps to...
Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, that way you'll get notified to all my new videos when I upload them. And if you want to contact me, you can do so through my website, the link's in the description below. See you next time.